Okay, it's a pleasure to be talking here at this uh, symposium in honor of Nambu. Uh, my talk will be composed of two parts, somewhat related to these papers, and also to the paper on superconductivity. Um, and I think these papers were pretty amazing, that they were um, written just a few years after the BCS theory, and he was trying to input the new results of condensed matter into models for particle physics. And this interaction between condensed matter physics and high energy theory continues well till today. So as I said, we'll, uh, the, the outline of this talk will be actually two different topics. Um, the first will be related to those papers in the sense that we'll try to give an everyday example of a gauge, gauge symmetry and gauge theory. And the second is we'll discuss some aspects of a quantum mechanical model um, that arises in condensed mat from condensed matter theory that has some features in common with near extremal black holes. So, um, now let's first talk about the first topic. So we know uh, that gauge symmetry and its realizations are very uh, important and central to modern uh, particle physics and condensed matter and so on. And um, so, of course, is the mechanism of uh, so-called symmetry breaking or the realization of the gauge symmetry in the Higgs phase, to which uh, also Nambu contributed in a very important way. Um, and one question that arises is, and this arose for me personally when I was giving, when I had to give some public talks on the Higgs and things like this. Uh, we said, well, how do you explain it correctly? Do you, do you say that you have a particle that moves through some honey and that was the Higgs mechanism is? Or, um, and I think the, the problem is that in order to explain honestly what the Higgs uh, mechanism is, you need to explain what gauge theories are. And so you can ask, well, is there an every, a good everyday example of the gauge theory? And so there is a nice example, and I'll discuss a simple economic model that displays gauge symmetry, and it's found in reality in the Higgs phase. And so that's uh, what the first part of, part of the talk will be. So the gauge symmetry uh, will be the symmetry of prices. So we normally measure the price of an object in dollars, right? So we say, for example, your salary, let's say, is $1,000. Well, let's say someone would, wants to make you a millionaire, right? And so they define a new unit. They will say that $1 is going to be 1,000, let's say, call it T's or Trump's, OK? <laughs> and so now, now your salary uh, will be a million Trump's. And, <laughs> and you became instantly a millionaire, right? So you should definitely be very happy about this. Now, that's until you realize that, OK, all the other prices were also in dollars. And uh, after you do this, the prices will uh, increase in a proportionate way. And therefore, nothing really happens, right? Nothing changes. This is purely a gauge symmetry. Uh, it's completely, its effects are completely unobservable. And uh, notice, by the way, this is exactly a gauge symmetry. It's not an analysis, it's an exact gauge symmetry. And the gauge group is R, but not U1, but that's the only difference with electromagnetism. And of course, the good observables are uh, gauge invariant quantities, such as the ratio of the price of apples versus your salary. Okay? Um, now, this is very close to what Weil had in mind with uh, the concept of gauge symmetry. And in this context of economics, it was uh, discussed before by some of these authors. This was a paper in the American Journal of Physics, uh, discussing some of these things. Now, gauge symmetry, this type of gauge symmetry, arises in the real world, usually in countries with high inflation. You remove uh, a few zeros in your currency, and so here there is a change gauge symmetry where you drop three of three zeros. Uh, they had to do it quickly, so they just printed it in the same banknotes. Nothing really changes. Now. I'm one car it's amusing to know that one current peso is equal to 10 to the 13 of the ones that where I was born <laughs> in Argentina. <laughs> so that happened many times. Uh, and I assure, you, I assure you that nothing really happens when you do this <laughs> process. <laughs> now, by the way, this is just half of cosmic inflation. So that's <laughs> half the number of peoples. <laughs> um. OK, so that's, that was the gauge symmetry. Now, what are gauge potentials? So gauge potentials are uh, the exchange rates. 
So there is some locality that uses dollars and some other one that uses, let's say, euros. And let's say we have some exchange rate, let's say two dollars is equal to one euro. Um, now, if, um, if we change here to trumps, we will have now 2,000 trumps equal to one dollar. So the gauge symmetry changes the gauge potentials, right? Um, and it's sometimes uh, what we normally call the gauge field in physics, of course, the, expo the, the log of the, what would be the exchange rate here, the, the ratio of these two numbers. Um, now, um, of course, uh, we can have different countries with different currencies. And if we change uh, the gauge symmetry, is of course a local operation, as we know in physics. So we change this one, only these uh, exchange rates get changed, but not the other exchange rates. Um, now, do you see anything interesting about this set of exchange rates? One says doesn't match. Is it good or bad? It's bad. That's the reason why you're not in Wall Street, I guess. We are not in Wall Street. <laughs> what? That's again the reason why you're not in Wall Street. Right? <laughs> okay, so a person in Wall Street would say that this is an opportunity to speculate. Okay? Yeah, or arbitrage, yeah. Um, that's the right word, yeah, I guess. Thanks, Douglas. There is one person here who's <laughs> in Wall Street. <laughs> so, um, so what do you do here? Do you see what you do? You start with 10 pesos, uh, you go to 1 euro, 2 dollars, uh, 12 pesos, okay? So you earn 20% by following the circle, right? And in physics, we call this a magnetic field. Okay. Or holonomy or magnetic field through this plane. Um, now speculators would uh, move along this circuit, right, doing this uh, this operation, and and that's exactly what electrons do uh, when they move in the magnetic field, right? They move in circles. You might think the electrons don't know what they are doing. They know pretty well what they are doing. They are just earning money. Okay. <laughs> Um, you can do electric fields in the same way, it's the same basic idea. So you say that, um, so you have some exchange rates at one moment of time, you have some other set of exchange rates at a different moment of time, and then uh, you have some exchange rate along the time direction, which normally we call interest rates, and uh, we, the interest rates could be different. So we could have an interest rate of, let's say, 1% here and 2% here. And uh, then you borrow money here in the US, let's say, and then you put their money in the bank in the UK. And then after some period, you just pay your debt here and uh, you earn some money, okay? And that's how uh, apparently George Soros became a billionaire. And that's exactly what uh, would happen in a situation where you have an electric field, you have an electron, and a positron, they move this way in the presence of an electric field. So you create a pair, and the electric fields initially moving them, moving far, moving apart, and then the electric field puts them back together. So um, this is um, essentially. Um, so I'll now discuss a financial model for the ether. So we'll make the model uh, more similar to physics. So so far I discussed some similarities, but uh, we will make up some rules. And these are rules that we have in physics, but they are not uh, quite true in economics. And uh, the rules are very simple, and the reasons is one of the main reasons that physics is simpler than economics. Um, so the rules are that uh, countries will be arranged in a grid or a lattice. Um, so instead of having this set of countries, we have this set of countries. Um, and so, uh, the exchange rates can be all different. So here, each, imagine that this is like a bridge connecting two countries, and there's a little bank at the bridge, and it sets the exchange rates. And we only have exchange rates between neighbors. So in the real world, we can exchange uh, money from one country or with money from any different country. There is some exchange rate for that. That would be like a wild link in these two far neighbors. We don't have this in physics. We only have exchange rates between two nearest neighbors. Okay. 
Um, and you cannot trade by phone, you cannot fly, you can only walk from one country to the next, and from the next and so on. So countries are like points in space, and if you want to, um, so if you have some amount of money here, in let's say dollars, you have to go to the next country, let's say it's Europe, then you have to change all your dollars for euros, and then when you mo move to the next country, let's say Russia, you have to move, change all your country to rubles, and so on. Um, and in this way, you can uh, move along closed circuits and earn money, perhaps, or uh, and do whatever you need to do. Um, so at each country, as I said, you can only have the currency of that country, uh, and you have to exchange all your money at the bridge. If you come here and you exchange it this way, and then you come back and you exchange it back, you get back your original money. There are no commissions. Okay? So th these are all things that make uh, the economic well, different than the real economy. And this is one of the reasons why sim physics is simpler than econ economics. Another reason that I won't discuss in detail is that we are normally taking the continuum limit where all this is uh, happening at very short distances. Um, now, in the case of pure electromagnetism, it's the case where the only thing you can carry when you go from one country to the next is money. So the only uh, thing that is relevant are exchange rates. So now let's discuss uh, new fields. So if we have electromagnetism coupled to something else, then we'll have new fields. And that arises when we consider other things that we can carry from one country to the next country. So let's say we can carry gold from one country to the next. Okay? So now gold will have a price at each country. We are going to call it P of X. X denotes which country we are in or which point in space, and P is the price of uh, gold. And under local gauge transformations, P of X changes in uh, the usual way, as we saw before with bananas or, or pears and so on. So it's convenient to take the log of uh, the price and say that under a local currency unit, that uh, log uh, shifts. Right? And so in this way, we have the usual uh, transformations for, um, so the transformations of exchange rates are the transformations of the ordinary gauge field and the transformations of prices, or log of prices, is the transformation of a field which shifts. It's like the, the face of some field. Okay? Here there are no eyes, so this is, uh, the gauge group is, is R, so things uh, just get rescaled under the gauge transformation. Um, so here, uh, so then if, uh, again, uh, we, we have the exchange rates, and now in addition we have gold, and the speculators can now uh, carry gold or money as they see fit. Um, of course, uh, the here, well, this is the gauge transformation I discussed before. Um, now notice, uh, well, of course, uh, this is as in ordinary gauge theories, the gauge symmetry is still present. It is not broken, it's just realized in this uh, Higgs phase. Now, um, we go back to this uh, situation. So now there are new opportunities to speculate. So you can, uh, in this example, for example, you would start um, with uh, six pesos here. You would uh, exchange them for six dollars, um, buy, um, buy gold, and then uh, come here and get, uh, sell the gold and get uh, more pesos, okay? Well, let's say we start with one peso, we get uh, one bar of gold, and we sell it here for six pesos. So we earn the factor of six. Now, what do we call these opportunities to speculate in physics? Uh, so the gain of this circle, this circuit, um, is well related to the ratio, well, the price of gold here versus, uh, well, the exchange rate and so on is this particular ratio. And uh, this, when it, the price is, uh, when we expand, when it, we take the log of this, uh, we find this combination, which is nothing else than the covariant derivative of this phase, or the covariant derivative of C. Okay. Um, so that we call the covariant derivative of uh, the field C. Um, now, there is the analog of unitary gauge, which is to set uh, all the currencies in all countries so that uh, the price of gold is one in all the countries. Um, and in that case, uh, the exchange rates remain as a variable. So this is different than the gold standard, where you fix all the exchange rates to one. So this is a situation where 
uh, the exchange rates continue to be present. But now uh, the opportunity to, to speculate is a little clearer because whenever there is an exchange rate which is not one to one, we will have an opportunity to speculate. So exchange rates remain as variables, and the opportunities to, well, to speculate are clearer. And the fact that there is now a special exchange rate here, so which is just simply one to one, is related to the mass generation or the mass of the gauge bosons. And we'll see that a little more clearly later. Um, so what we described so far is just the kinematics of gauge theory. So this is uh, this economy sort of has all the this economical model has all the right kinematics of uh, of gauge theory, and of course uh, it's not surprising because we said that this symmetry of prices of rescaling the, the units of price is an exact is exactly a correct uh, gauge um, gauge theory. I mean it's a, it's a gauge symmetry. So. All the kinematics should match with uh, what we have for gauge theory. Now, one question we can ask uh, is whether we can recover the dynamics of ordinary gauge theories that we know uh, from some decent assumptions uh, that makes at least some sense in, uh, in the real economy. And what we are trying to do is really not any different than what Maxwell has done before, except that he did it with a mechanical model, so he rec recovered gauge theories from a mechanical model, we are just simply trying to get it from a financial model. So Maxwell viewed the ether, ether as a mechanical model, uh, Nambu viewed the ether as a superconductor. We are just in the spirit of time, so I guess, trying to understand the ether as a financial model. Um, so, uh, so now I'll try to describe some ways in which we can, one can get Maxwell's equations. And I'll discuss two versions. One is uh, we're going to get the Euclidean equations. And in the other one, we'll get the Lorentzian equations. It's a little harder to get the Lorentzian equations. Well, um, you, you, you'll see. Um, so just also for, to get the equations, there is some small subtlety I might discuss later. But it's uh, simpler to get the equations um, when uh, the, we have only small deviations from one to one exchange rates and small deviations, so let's say, of prices from one. Okay. Uh, so we'll work to first order in those deviations. Um, so in order to, to get the equations, we are going to assume that there exist uh, certain short-range speculators that what they do is they follow the simplest... Uh, so we have all the countries arranged on a grid, as we discussed, and we have speculators that follow the simplest uh, circuits in this grid. Um, and they will uh, speculate, and if there is an imbalance, they will start circulating, carrying an amount of money which is uh, proportional to the imbalance. So if the, the opportunity to speculate is very big, so if the gain is very large, there will be more speculators. Okay? If, they gain, if they don't gain anything going around here, there will be zero speculators. They will carry zero money. Okay? Does this sound like a reasonable behavior for the speculators? I think it's a reasonable behavior for the speculators, right? So the amount of money they will carry is proportional to the magnetic field. So it's just simply, um, for small deviations, it's just simply the magnetic field um, on this uh, plaquette. Now, imagine that uh, we have the speculators following this circuit, and there is another set of speculators following this circuit. So there is some magnetic flux through this uh, plaquette and some other magnetic flux through this plaquette, which could be different. So let's say that these two magnetic fluxes are different. Then in this case, there will be more speculators going this way than uh, speculators uh, going this way. Um, and so there will be some net uh, flux of money through this link. right? So this bank here, if let's say the bank is changing between dollars and uh, let's say pesos, will have we'll start seeing an accumulation of pesos, let's say, versus dollars. And the bank might not like this, right? So let's say that uh, the banks will always adjust all exchange rates in such a way that this never happens. They will always um, behave in such a way that um, there is an equal amount of speculators going, that the total flux of money through this link is zero. So in this two-dimensional case, that would imply that the, um, the total magnetic, the total flux through this plaquette is equal to the flux through this plaquette. And in a higher dimensional case, there are more plaquettes that, uh, that end on this link. So the plaquette that is in the vertical direction that goes inside the screen and so on. And the 
the difference between the, all the, the, the net amount of money that goes through here is the flux through this minus the flux here. So that's the derivative of the flux along this direction. And then there is the flux in direction perpendicular to the screen minus the other one and so on. And that's just the same combination that appears in the Maxwell equation. Okay? Of course, the Avianchi identity is uh, immediately obeyed because we, are, we had the gauge potential. Okay? So in this way, we got the vacuum um, equations. Um, uh, if, we in, if we include time as before, put in the exchange rate, the interest rates, uh, so we could have speculators that follow with the time circuits in the same way, but we still get the Euclidean equations. We don't get the Lorentzian equations uh, from, from this hypothesis. Um, now, one can also get the massive vector equations. Um, so the, the equations that follow from the Higgs mechanism. So there uh, we get a net flow of money. We, demand, we, we do the same as before. And the only difference is that there will be speculators. So we have speculators following the, uh, these money circuits. And there will be other speculators. We'll call them the gold circuit speculators. What they do is they follow um, this. So only between two neighboring countries, they just uh, follow uh, they, they do this speculative circle, and the number of speculators that follow this circuit, again, are proportional to the uh, gain that they get. So the more gain there is, the more speculators that do this particular process. But now the flux of money through here depends on not only the difference of, magne of uh, magnetic fields, but also on the gradient of uh, the C field. Okay? Uh, so that the condition that there is no net flux here, that implies uh, this condition. So so it's the correct equation with uh, now this current on the right-hand side. And uh, no net gold accumulation at the countries. Um, so we can also impose a similar condition for the price of... So here there is gold coming into this country, and there are speculators that in the neighboring links. So in the four, in this case, there would be four neighboring links in this two-dimensional case. And demanding that there is no net gold, gold flux into one country imposes this condition. So we get the equations. Um, now we can ask whether we can get the Lorentzian uh, field equations in a similar way. Um, so that we assume there is time as before, and uh, we have the connection, the time directions are interest rates as before. So we can get them by doing an unrealistic as assumption, which would be that speculator along circuits that involve the time direction want to lose money, right? Then we get the extra minus sign that we needed in the equation, in the Lorentzian equations. But I, I think this is ugly. So let's uh, better option is the following. So to get the Lorentzian equations, uh, we now assume that there are speculators following these spatial circles, circuits. So for each spatial circuit, there will be speculators that follow it. There will be uh, no speculators along the time circuits. Um, and um, they again, same assumption as before, they carry an amount of money which is proportional to the gain. Uh, now, um, as, I said, as I, we said before, if this is, let's say, the US and this is Europe, we have pesos here, we have uh, dollars here and, um, and euros here, and if there is some net flow of money through here, the bank will start seeing uh, that it has more dollars and, uh, and fewer euros. Okay? And the bank will decide to, so the new rule is that we'll decide, uh, the bank will decide to change the exchange rate, so A was the exchange rate, and so it will change the exchange rate with a speed which is proportional to its balance sheet. So how many more uh, dollars uh, versus euros it has, okay? And that balance sheet is proportional to the integral of the money flux, okay? Or what is equivalent by taking the time derivative is, uh, this is just the Maxwell equation, the correct Maxwell equation with the correct sign. Okay? Um, and uh, if you add gold with the same assumptions, uh, the same behavior for the bank, uh, you get the correct uh, massive vector field equation. Um, and if you assume similar dynamics for the price of gold, you get the, um, well, you get this other equation. And these two equations together, are uh, essentially the correct uh, PROC equations. Um, and I, ha I, fi I really fine-tuned the coefficients to, meet the to make the speed of the longitudinal and transverse modes the same. And that uh, is familiar because we are, 
we, we had a non-relativistic uh, theory. Right? So we had to make relativity emerge. Well, we had to make sure it's uh, relativistic. Um, now, of course, there are many comments. So, uh, well, everything that I discussed so far is well, a lattice gauge theory and some lattice model. Um, now, in, of course, compared to the economies, the importance of the spatial arrangement of countries, that's the structure of space, which is uh, determined the long distance physics, and well, all these things are very familiar. Um, and one other comment is that these short distance speculators that we used for the Maxwell equations can be um, viewed as uh, the massive fields we integrate out when we start with a lattice model or a, <coughs> a, gauge, or a gauge field without a kinetic term and we integrate out uh, some massive fields to get the correct uh, kinetic term for the gauge, gauge theory. So it's a, it's a little model where we have something analogous to emergent kinetic terms for the gauge, for the gauge fields. Um, that's, uh, one can make it, uh, well, yeah. One can make a probabilistic version of this, and um, I won't discuss it, but where uh, you, you basically put in some, uh, you say that all these exchange rates are random, and you put, uh, you say that the deviation uh, from one to one exchange rates, well, that, that, that the probability of finding the exchange rates in any configuration has to be gauge invariant and given by some local expression, then the most natural action at long distance is, of course, the Maxwell action. Um, and uh, so you get the, the same as uh, Euclidean uh, electromagnetism. Okay. Um, now, in the real economy, you have everything interacting with everything else. Um, and um, in some, and, but it might be that their speculators only exploit short circuits. And in some cases, it leads to interesting behavior, as we will see in a moment later. So this is my attempt to connect uh, the first part of the talk with the second part of the talk, so, which has random interactions. And, um, but the interactions are involved a few variables at a time. Um, so that was the end of the economic models. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and now uh, comes uh, models again. We are going to talk about some models with random interactions. And I will talk about a particular model that uh, has condensed matter physics roots, but is interesting for the gauge gravity duality. And I guess Subir was pointed this out a few years ago, but I completely I didn't understand didn't understand it, um, didn't appreciate it. Uh, but so he and Yi had proposed a certain model that has a, an interesting conformal, uh, conformal limit in the infrared. And well, uh, George and Parcolet also did a lot of work on this model, as well as uh, Kitai, who did some interesting contributions, as I will say bef later. And recently, there's been a few papers on uh, this paper is on this model in particular, and this is uh, related related ideas. Um, and what the new things in what I'm going to discuss uh, will be in a paper with, that I'm writing with Douglas Stanford, but most of what I discuss here will be a review of this model. Um, so this is a model which involves only time, so it's a quantum mechanical model. Uh, the variables are Majorana fermions that have this anti-commutation relation, so you can view them as uh, simply gamma matrices. Imagine n gamma matrices. Um, and you write down a Hamiltonian, uh, which couples uh, four of these at a the time. So out of this n, uh, we only couple four at a time, and we sum over all uh, possible couplings. We have these random couplings. And there, the original model has these couplings being uh, random, chosen from a random distribution, where the distribution is Gaussian, with no correlations between different couplings. And each coupling is a Gaussian with a particular width, and you adjust the strength of the, I mean, you adjust the width of the Gaussian so as to have a nice uh, large n counting. Uh, and j will be the parameter of the model. So the model has a single uh, dimension one uh, coupling. And there is another variant of the model where you think of j as a field with very slow dynamics. Um, and for the calculations I'm going to discuss, the two models uh, give the same answer. Um, but we can think in, in any, any of the two versions of the model. So uh, what I'm going to discuss will be mostly for the random model. 
Um, and of course, we'll take n to be large. Um, so the model is uh, solvable in the large n limit. And uh, it has the interesting feature that it flows to in the IR to what I'm going to call an almost uh, conformal fixed point. Um, and so this uh, almost conformal fixed point uh, is, uh, works for, um, as I said, there is this dimensionful coupling that sets a certain time scale in the UV. So for times shorter than this time, the theory is essentially topological. It has no dynamics for uh, times shorter than that. And for times longer is when uh, we get these non-trivial dynamics. And for times and temperatures, inverse temperatures, much, much longer, then we start seeing the discreteness of the model, the fact that there might be a unique ground state. Well, that there will be a unique ground state, for example, that's seen only at extremely long times. Okay? We see the discreteness of the spectrum. So we are interested in these intermediate time scales. Now, the spectrum is uh, fairly unremarkable. Uh, naively, one might have a, well, I, yeah. Um, so the spectrum is, uh, you can, well, you, I, I don't know. Douglas Stanford could uh, diagonalize this for a sufficiently large number of, uh, of fermions. And the spectrum looks very much like the spectrum of a random matrix. So we have, this is zero. We have symmetry between energy and minus energy because these couplings could be pos equally, probably positive or negative. And um, we have a distribution uh, which basically looks, uh, at the level of the spectrum, it looks very much like a random matrix. These models, uh, as we'll discuss later in more detail, have some ground state entropy. Um, and one might incorrectly have expected some feature of the spectrum here at low energies. Uh, uh, related to the ground state entropy, but uh, that's not what happens, and I'll explain how this is consistent with the notion of ground state entropy. Now, the reason this is solvable is uh, due to the simple structure of diagrams, which um, are, as uh, Steve uh, Schenker said, they are very similar to the diagrams one gets in the uh, large N O N models, and this is just slightly different version. Um, the diagrams are slightly more complicated, but not uh, much more complicated. And the, uh, the you can write down some Schwinger Dyson equation, similar to what one does for the Toft model, for example, the other solvable models. Um, and so you can sum the diagrams by first uh, grouping them into, so you group all the terms into a term that is the self-energy, which is uh, all diagrams, uh, one particle reducible, called that sigma. And then uh, you, you, you get uh, corrections to the, the self-energy contains a first diagram, which is uh, three fermions. So the, the yeah, may, maybe I should first explain this diagram. So here we have the free fermion propagator. Here we have two insertions of the Hamiltonian. The dotted line are just correlations uh, of the J field. So we pick vertices which are uh, where the J field is. Uh, so basically, these are the, the same two vertices because the only uh, the same term in the Hamiltonian. So we have some term here, and we have the same term here. And um, then all the indices here appear in common. We sum over them. They give some factor of n that cancels the factor of n that we had explicitly in the vertex. So this diagram is of order 1. And other diagrams that we could write down uh, will be of uh, higher order, that, that are not of this form. So this is the only diagram we can write down at, uh, at this order, but at higher orders there are other diagrams that are not of this form that are suppressed by 1 over n terms. Um, OK, so you, the one feature is that the solution of the model involves finding a function, which is a function of uh, two times, which is basically the fermion propagator. Um, and, um, and there are some equations for this function of two times, um, which uh, we wrote here. It's not important to uh, understand in great detail the, well, I mean, if you want to solve it, it is important, but uh, for the purposes of understanding the idea, it's not important. So you have some equations which uh, embody that sum of diagrams. You can also get these equations from a classical action for the field, for these fields that depend on two times. Um, and um, the equations uh, are, are relatively simple. So one equation is simpler in the time domain. The other equation is better in, this is a convolution, so it's simpler in the frequency domain. But what's important here is that you can, if you go to long distances, 
you can drop this uh, time derivative uh, term. Um, and if you do that, then you find that your theory has some, some conformal symmetry, and in particular, choosing a g, which is a conformal invariant uh, two-point function, so a simple power law, and uh, choosing this delta appropriately, in this particular case, it's uh, delta is equal to one quarter. Um, you just fix it by solving these two equations. And in that case, that's a solution. Now, more is true about these equations, which is the fact that if uh, you take now the simplified equations, which are these two equations, and this equation where we drop the time derivative, which has this form, then uh, if you have a solution g, then if we are given an arbitrary function f of tau, then we can generate another solution by doing a reparametrization of the first solution. Okay? So the model, um, yeah. So this can be used, for example, if uh, we have this solution, which uh, would be the, the solution for a scale invariant system at zero temperature. We can do this particular reparametrization that maps the line to a circle. Uh, to get the finite temperature solutions. Right? Now notice that uh, this type of symmetry, so a symmetry where we change time to some function of time, that's uh, what we would call the full conformal group in one plus one in in one dimensions, right? So that's uh, and it is the same as the group of all possible reparametrizations in that in one dimension. These functions uh, are not invariant under this full group. So this function, this particular solution, is only invariant under an SL2R uh, subgroup. So when we write down uh, this solution, we are spontaneously breaking the, the symmetry group to uh, only an SL2R. And so there will be many number Goldstone bosons that will come back in a second. Um, so this uh, symmetry group is, of course, very nice. Uh, and, but there is a slight uh, issue, which is the fact that we have an infinite number of solutions. Uh, so as I said, f is like a nambul Goldstone boson for this spontaneous breaking of the uh, reparametrization symmetry. So let me go back. I said there's a point I want to say here. So these equations are reparametrization invariant. So you can view this, these equations as the UV Lagrangian, if you wish, which is fully symmetric. Um, but, um, um, but then, once you pick a solution, you break that symmetry. Now, the, the fixed, and, and this will cause some problems, uh, because, for example, if we calculate 1 over n corrections or correlation functions, we'll have to sum over all possible intermediate states, and these states will have zero action and will give rise to diversions. Uh, but the fix is to remember that the symmetry is also explicitly broken. So this is actually not the symmetry of the original model. It's only a symmetry of the simplified model where we drop the time derivative, right? The, where, where we drop one of the terms in the equation. So we cannot go all the way to the low energy limit. We have to keep, uh, we have to remember that uh, we are slightly breaking the symmetry. So, so it's very similar to um, what we do with the pion mass in chiral symmetry breaking, which was uh, discussed in this Nambu papers we showed at the beginning, the Nambu and Alcino papers. Um, so in this case, the, uh, the analog of the pion mass term is uh, a term which uh, has the form of a Schwarzian derivative of this function f. So this is basically the simplest term that we can write down uh, that um, so the simplest local term uh, consistent uh, with the symmetries, with the fact that uh, we are not breaking the assault to R and so on. Um, so there is a factor of 1 over j, so that if you naively take j to infinity, which would be um, going to very low energies, so that would be the limit where we ex expect to find the exact conformal symmetry, then formally we set in this term to zero and its effects drop down. Um, but uh, we should really keep it finite, and uh, we, keep this, we keep this term in the, in the action, and this will have some important terms. So for example, if we compute the free energy, so a simple application of this is the computation of the free energy. So the free energy uh, can be computed by doing that conformal symmetry transformation we just discussed, 
And if we did just that conformal symmetry transformation, um, we, would, um, we would find the free energy which is totally temperature independent. Okay? So we would get a term that perhaps could have an interpretation as an extremal entropy, though we wouldn't get it from this computation. So to com compute the extremal entropy in this model, you have to do something different. However, this Schwarzian action gives you uh, this other term, which is a correction to the extremal entropy, and it's the near extremal entropy. It has the 1 over j. This 1 over j comes directly from this uh, term in the action, um, and, well, this factor of beta, and then there is a number that uh, depends on the number that appeared in the action before. And so here we get this from uh, this number goes to mechanism together with uh, the explicit breaking. This uh, linear term is just a ground state energy and comes from, let's say, UV divergences that you might uh, have in this low energy theory, so it's not very interesting. Um, but so, so here you see uh, that um, this breaking of the conformal symmetry is, uh, plays an important role. Now, it's a short uh, remark about uh, the extremal entropy. Um, so the idea is that um, the extremal entropy is coming here because if we looked at the energy distribution, so of course when we look at low energies, we are looking at the spectrum of the theory near the end point at, uh, at one corner of this diagram. This is the same spectrum that we showed before. And the idea is that the density, the energy density there, the de sorry, the density of levels uh, for each energy, so the number of levels uh, per unit energy, uh, goes uh, like some function of energy independent of n that gives somehow, it looks like this function is actually a square root, so exactly as in the random matrix. But there is a big prefactor which is exponential in n. Recall that the total number of states goes like 2 to the n, so it's uh, exponential in n. And so the idea is that we have a shape here uh, which has this uh, big factor multiplying. And that gives rise to the ground state energy, uh, entropy, and of course uh, the corrections, near extremal entropy correction we discussed would correspond to this, uh, but so on. Um, now, um, we'll discuss some features of the four-point function. Um, na naively, if uh, you looked at the two-point function and it had a conformal invariant answer for the two-point function, you might have expected a conformal invariant expression for the four-point function. But uh, due to the reparameterization, this reparameterization zero modes, if you try to calculate this four-point function in, in this low energy theory, you just uh, get infinity. So you get infinity unless you uh, take into account uh, that explicit breaking of the symmetry that I discussed, um, and then you get a finite answer, and that finite answer uh, is not conformal. Okay? But you can compute it. Um, so the, the still, so even though it's not conformal, the conformal symmetry and its light breaking are running the show somehow. You can get all these results by uh, using the conformal symmetry and this peculiar way in which it is uh, broken. So, um, so I, I call this, so I think this should be called an almost conformal field theory, the sense that uh, the or almost conformal field theory one. And this is how this conformal symmetry is realized in quantum mechanics, and there are probably more examples of this in uh, other systems, but this is certainly one of them. Uh, we'll discuss another one in a second. Um, and the, the A has to be in there, so the conformal field theory doesn't make sense on its own. So this is different than in higher dimensions. In two dimensions, in three dimensions, and so on, we can talk about the conformal field theory fixed point, and the conformal field theory on its own is a completely consistent, well-defined theory. So in this case, the conformal theory is not, uh, the conformal theory is not consistent on, on its own. As, I, as we saw here, we would get infinities and so on. Um, but what is consistent is this almost uh, conformal theory. And this is how somehow conformal symmetry is realized in quantum mechanical systems. Um, now, there were other realizations people discussed of conformal quantum mechanics uh, by but those, those uh, systems typically realized uh, only some SL2R uh, group, and there was no sense in which they had the full conformal group, all the reparameterizations. Uh, here, there is some sense in which we have all the reparameterizations, but in a slightly broken phase. Um, and one, well, my interest in this is mainly the fact that uh, this is exactly the, has exactly the right flavor 
for uh, being related to ADS2 um, or near extremal black holes. So near extremal black holes uh, have a nearly ADS2 region. And again, as in this quantum mechanical model, so gravity in ADS2 by itself uh, does not make sense. So if you add small uh, excitations to ADS2, they destroy the ADS2 boundary conditions, you get infinities, you get answers that don't make sense. Okay? So the only, the only thing that makes sense is to slightly break the symmetry. Um, and for example, a simple model for, for doing this, and this is essentially how it arises from a higher dimensional theory, is, um, the, is the following. So we have uh, the usual Einstein term in two dimensions, plus the cosmological constant that would be related to ADS2. But we still have a field uh, which, um, from a higher dimensional origin, would be like the size of the transverse sphere. So we have ADS2 times S2. That field would be the size of the S2. And we cannot completely forget this field. We have to still include it. Um, and the simplest idea is to, the simplest action is just this action, which is called the Teitelbaum Yakiv model. We can add the term phi zero plus uh, this term. This term is completely topological in two dimensions. So all this would do is would add uh, a constant to, uh, to the action and would give the extremal entropy of the black hole. Uh, but all the near extremal discussion is run by these uh, couplings. Um, and again, as I said, uh, this uh, phi could come from the, ex the other dimensions. And now, this model is uh, really very simple, but somewhat subtle. The equation of motion for the field phi uh, is like a Lagrange multiplier that says that we have a constant curvature solution. And so the metric is uh, really the metric of ADS2. Um, and so it fixes the metric to be that of exactly ADS2 with no perturbation. Uh, but the equation of motion for the metric uh, gives some equations for phi. And it gives a bunch of equations that fix phi almost completely. So phi is not a dynamical field. It's a somehow a cons constrained field that um, is completely constrained up to a few numbers, uh, up to a few constants. So for example, uh, the metric, this is one way in which we can write the metric of uh, the Euclidean version of ADS2 or hyperbolic space. Um, and phi is uh, completely constrained to have this form. So there is one constant, which is the value of phi at the horizon or at the center. And um, the other two constants I was allow, allow, uh, alluding to is that we can place uh, this not just purely at the center of this space, but at any other point. Of course, we could choose the coordinates so that that point is at the center, but that's uh, the most general solution. Um, OK. Now, of course, um, this is uh, th in a uh, case where this f comes from higher dimensions and so on, uh, when phi is sufficiently large, we need to change to a new UV theory. So this makes sense um, when phi is relatively small, when phi becomes uh, large enough. And what large enough means depends on what the full UV theory is. Um, then we'll have to change to a new UV theory. Um, OK. Um. And then, uh, asymptotically, uh, on the boundary, we would put the ordinary boundary conditions we normally put in ADS in these situations, are that the metric on the boundary is uh, some variable, some coordinate, which we normally call the dual field theory coordinate, times uh, some cutoff. And then we'll take this cutoff to 0. And then we'll also set the phi at the boundary to scale in some way. So since phi is diverging near the boundary, we take it to be scale in some way, and we call this renormalized value of phi. And typically, we can call it to be, we can uh, set it to a constant. So that's what we would choose in this model. Now, let me first say uh, what would happen if we didn't have this phi. So imagine we forgot about phi, and we are just doing ADS2. And we're trying to solve this problem putting just the first of the boundary conditions. Um, so we're going only to put these boundary conditions. So a feature that happens is that uh, there are, there's an infinite number of solutions, there's an infinite number of configurations uh, with uh, these boundary conditions. So once we fix these particular boundary conditions. And these boundary solutions, this infinite number of configurations correspond to picking arbitrary curves in, um, 
in, so t take ADS2 and let's pick some arbitrary curves. Let's pick some rho, which is very large, but an arbitrary function of uh, tau. Um, and then we can just fix the relationship between the time here in the, in t in, in the ADS2 coordinates, so in these coordinates, to the field theory time. We can adjust it in such a way that the induced metric along this curve uh, is always uh, constant, right? So what this is saying is that the metric is constant as units of time, and all we are doing here is just, uh, so this is like proper time along this geodesic. Uh, no, this is not the geodesic, sorry, I misspoke. Along this curve. Um, and well, of course, uh, given any shape of this curve, we can always adjust our velocity here in order to, to make this the proper time, uh, proper length. Um, so there is an infinite number of solutions, and that infinite number is the same as the infinite number of solutions that, or well, it's, it's analogous, let's say, uh, to the infinite number of solutions we had in, the, uh, in that uh, such the E Kitayev model, if we ignore the breaking of conformal symmetry. These are somewhat similar to the boundary gravitons of ADS3. Um, and one difference is that here one really must break the symmetry. So for the boundary gravitons, we can, uh, in ADS3, we can really put the dynamics which is comparable, compatible, or, well, which is necessary for the conformal symmetry um, of the theory. But here uh, we cannot put any dynamics unless we break the symmetry. Um, so that, uh, in this uh, model, ap arises when phi, when we also s remember that we need to put the boundary condition for phi, and in that case there is just a single solution. For, so for example, if this phi is constant, we would have a, the, one of these solutions, just a circle, or if uh, phi is an arbitrary function of uh, the proper length, we would, have, we would choose the circle where we have the corresponding value of phi, right? So we would just move in or out uh, of uh, so there, is, there would be a special point where phi is a minimum, phi is growing as we move outwards, um, and then we just uh, move along this curve, choosing the appropriate value of phi. Um, so here this green line is saying that uh, this ADS2 doesn't, we don't expect it to continue forever, but at some point we make a transition to something else, but we are looking at the theory in uh, the situation where we almost have the conformal symmetry. And one can uh, take the action for gravity in this title von Jakob model and evaluate it. Um, and so we can calculate the action. So we can look at uh, one of these boundary, uh, some boundary curve before we put the second condition. We can look at uh, the action for arbitrary boundary curves, and we get that the gravitational action reduces to this Schwarzschild action we discussed before. In other words, um, we have the this Yakiv Teitelbaum action, uh, and then we have the usual Gibbons Hawking boundary term. And due to the equation of motion for phi, here um, that imposes that this is zero, so that this term doesn't contribute to the, uh, to the action. Uh, but we get some contribution from here, and the contribution we get from here um, is the Schwarzschild of the time coordinate as a function of the field theory time. Okay? So, uh, this, we can take it to be a constant or some function of u, but uh, we get an action which is the same as uh, the action we were getting for, uh, for, the, other, for the other model, um, for the Sashtev Yi Kitai model. And of course, uh, we're getting the same because both are governed by the same symmetry. Both are governed by this uh, slightly broken conformal symmetry. Um, T is the usual ADS2 time coordinates, and U is the boundary or quantum mechanical time coordinates. So in this system, we, it, lo it looks as if the, there are two time coordinates. One is the field theory time, so the, the time from the boundary coordinate, and T looks very much like a time that is more intrinsic to the system, a time measured somehow with some internal clock. I don't understand how this works in super detail, but this is the idea. Um, so there are many properties that are fixed by this Schwarzian action. Uh, one is the free energy I already discussed in detail. And the other one is the part of the four-point function that, uh, that comes from the explicit symmetry breaking. This leads in particular to a chaos-like behavior with maximal growth in the commutator. Uh, well, this, the, the relevance of between the relationship between chaos and uh, the out-of-time four-point function was discussed in detail in uh, Steve Schenker's talk. Um, and as he discusses it in general, and one can compute it in particular in this model, 
And when you do the calculation in this model, you find that the growth of the commutators or the out-of-time correlation function uh, has a term uh, growing in this, with this particular power of t uh, with an exponent which, is, um, which saturates this uh, chaos bound. So it grows as fast as it could in, uh, according to that bound. Um, now, the fact that it comes from the uh, explicit conformal breaking is related to the fact that this answer actually has an explicit power of j in front of a dimensionful constant. So the, this uh, part of the four-point function is not um, conformal invariant, uh, because just because only because of this prefactor, um, and can be obtained directly from that um, from that Schwarzian action. So that is that is right. And and this uh, form of the four-point function also agrees with the uh, similar four-point function computed in ADS2. Uh, it's a computation similar to uh, those uh, shockwave computations that Steve discussed. Uh, and with Douglas uh, Stanford, we have done some more computations in this model that I'm not going to discuss. Uh, but they depend more on the details of the model. We have calculated the spectrum of the model, and we've calculated the J-independent parts of the four-point function. So there are some parts of the four-point function that are J-independent and are conformal invariant, and, um, and so on. Um, but I won't discuss that in detail. Now, I'd like to discuss the one little aspect. Uh, so this is just a comment, a very simple comment. So the basic variable that appears in these models is this uh, um, function, correlation function of two times. Um, and uh, that's somehow the variable that becomes classical in these models. So in the large model, there is usually some variable that becomes classical. And in this uh, theory, that variable that becomes classical is this function of two times. It obeys a classical field equation, and so on. Um, and so in the, in the low energy theory, this uh, function is acted on by the conformal group. It has some transformation loss of the, conf the conformal group. And since it's a function of two times, we can act uh, with the Casimir of the conformal group that acts on two coordinates, right? So it's normally we consider such operator when we consider, for example, the operator product expansion, and we have two operators, and we act uh, with the Casimir on these two operators. Um, and so the conformal Casimir acting on G gives some uh, differential operator that acts on this two-point function. So it's a second order differential operator. So the, the, each uh, generator of the conformal group is a first order differential operator, some derivative with respect to one of these times. And when we act uh, with the Casimir, uh, it's uh, some derivative that acts on both of these times. And if we define uh, the let's say average time and difference time like this, we get some operator which is the same as a wave operator on ADS2. So demanding that the Casimir, so if we decompose, decomposing this G into uh, eigenvalues of the Casimir is equivalent to uh, looking at uh, the various um, uh, waves, uh, well, op fields with definite dimensions that we can have, or with definite masses that we can have in ADS2. Um, in fact, in this one-dimensional case, there is a simple uh, map that we can have between two points on the boundary and one point in the bulk that is uh, fully SL2R invariant. Um, OK, I, I finally would like to finish with some uh, generic comments. So this notion, so one thing, I, one message is that we should think about uh, both uh, ADS2, so ADS2 and CFT1. So there is no ADS2 CFT1 correspondence, but there should be an A, almost ADS2, almost CFT1 correspondence, in the sense that we have these uh, symmetries, um, almost slightly broken. And this notion appears in other places. So for example, inflation is an almost the sitter space. And we really need to have this other scalar field to end inflation and to lead to observables, to the inflationary observables that we see. So we, they don't make sense if we inflation didn't end had intended. So in order to define uh, the ordinary observables, we really uh, need, need to break the, the Sitter symmetry. In fact, uh, we can change one sign in this titlebone yakib model and have a type of inflationary theory where the inflaton is not actually a dynamical field, but it's actually is constrained. I don't know whether that's useful for anything. Well, 
Conclusions uh, are that uh, the idea of the vacuum as a superconductor is correct in many ways. Um, it's, of course, correct for the standard model. Uh, and also, we are now finding that black holes are a bit like high TC superconductors. Uh, of course, this correspondence uh, was uh, used a lot by, Sash Dev, well, by condensed matter physicists, including Sash Dev, and he mentioned it in his talk. Um, so, um, more like high TC in the sense that they are, the vacuum is, we have a strongly interacting theory as opposed to a weakly interacting theory as we, um, we, we can get the VCS theory in a simple, relatively simple large and weak interacting phase. Um, and we even have it in the real economy. So, and we probably have it in many other places, but time is too short to discuss. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Do we have any questions, comments? Is it late or? Here we have one. Is there any kind of intuitive explanation for why that Kataev model saturates the chaos bound? Um. Well, I guess it's a, uh, well, I can give you a mathematical explanation. So it's, it's because it's, um, which might not be the full explanation, but this uh, calculation of the four point function depending only on the slight breaking of the conformal symmetry. And so for any system that breaks slightly the conformal symmetry in the way that we discussed with the Schwarzian action, then you'll get uh, this maximal exponent and well, exactly the same form of the four point function. So the form of the four-point function in the Kitaev model and uh, in, the, in the gravity case. So uh, the, these two computations were actually done. Yeah, so you can do the computation in the gravity case, and you will get exactly the same answer as the, this answer that was proportional to beta j that Kitaev obtained in, in his model. So m maybe I should have mentioned that Kitaev did this. Uh, with the main new thing that Kitaev did was to compute this four-point function. Right? So the piece that the four-point function is proportional to beta j, that um, only depends on the Schwarzian picture. And he got it from the Schwarzian picture. And uh, in, ADS you, in, this, uh, in ADS, you also get it from, you can also get it from the Schwarzian picture. So it's the same basic origin. It's due to the, the symmetry of the problem. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there's something that's bothering me because uh, in uh, around 1990, people uh, looked at uh, the diffeomorphism group of the real line mod SL2R mm -hmm. that, as a Kähler manifold, and you can quantize that. It's a symplectic mm -hmm. manifold, mm -hmm. and if you do that then you get a model of 2D gravity where the main term in the action is a Schwarzian. Mm -hmm. The difference is the action you're writing is a one-dimensional action. They were getting a, an action in two dimensions. But they were extracting the Schwarzian out as an action out of uh, this mm -hmm. very same coset space. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've... Uh, Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I haven't. Uh, I, I, I don't know enough about the relationship to this other work. So, um, so this, this is purely in the. So this term in the action is purely appearing on the boundary, right? So it's purely a one-dimensional action. And notice I didn't make any uh, attempt even to quantize it. So we are describing it in the Euclidean description. So I only gave a Euclidean description of this term essentially. Um, so your formula that you get um, before you start talking about the Jacquin Teitelbaum yeah. model for G mm -hmm. had an exact SL2R symmetry. Yes, yes. But, but the Jacquin Teitelbaum model, the dilaton doesn't have the dilaton breaks that exactly. SL2R. Yes, yes, yes. So wouldn't it? Wouldn't you have expected some kind of model in which? Yeah, so, so in order to connect it, I, I didn't explain in detail how this is connected. So 
The, in our, so this model that would have this two-point function, you have to imagine the Yakiv title boy model uh, plus, let's say, a free field, let's say a free scalar field that doesn't couple to phi, can couple to the metric but not to phi. So then, because of the equation of motion of phi that s sets the metric to ADS2, this uh, scalar field would have a two-point function, which is just the ordinary two-point function, right? Um, just the two-point function I mentioned, which is SL to R invariant. And the only breaking of the symmetry arises because of the relationship between the field theory time and the boundary time. So once you put these boundary conditions and so on, you get... Uh, this was described in detail in a paper by Almeri and Polchinski. So I'm, let me go back. Um, so how the four-point function... Um, uh, let me see. So in this paper, they consider such a model, so they added to this a scalar field and they computed the correlation functions, right? So for example, the four-point function um, of Is the... That old paper? What? That's an old paper? No, it's a recent paper. It's maybe two years old. Yeah. Um. But it's not very different from the old papers. So you are familiar with your old papers of uh, the 90s, where you consider the, another version of uh, gravity, dilaton gravity, where a similar thing was happening, right? So all the massless fields were moving on a fixed metric, and all that was changing was the dilaton, right? So um, the, the massless fields were just uh, moving along a fixed, completely fixed background metric. In this case, the fixed background metric is ADS2. In your case, was just R2. Um, but... Uh, then the non-trivial dynamics, if you wish, was coming from the different from the dilaton profile that they were creating. These these waves, as they move around, as they move in, they create some dilaton profile that could be interpreted as a black hole appearing and, and so on. So it, it's in spirit is identical to the the papers you worked on in the 90s. Um, in detail, it's slightly different because of just the ADS2 symmetry, the conformal symmetry. That's the thing that makes them slightly different. 